ETF Prime is hosted by investment advisors of the ETF Store. This program is for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice. Investing in ETFs involves risk, including potential loss of principal. Any past performance figures discussed are not necessarily indicative of future results. The ETF Store is not affiliated with ETF.com or any of its affiliates. ETF.com's participation in this program should not be construed as an endorsement or an indication by ETF.com of the value of any ETF Store product or service. Visit ETFStore.com for more information. Now it's time for ETF Prime, where we discuss everything you need to know about exchange-traded funds and the world of investing. Whether you're an investing expert or just starting out, Nate and Connor will help you get up to date on what's happening on Wall Street and show you how exchange-traded funds can help lower your investment costs, reduce your tax bill, and allow you to take advantage of investment opportunities around the world. And now, the host of ETF Prime, Nate Geraci. Welcome to ETF Prime. I'm Nate Geraci. Actually rolling solo today. No Connor Kelly or Jason Lang, both of whom are enjoying a little summer vacation. But nonetheless, I have a fantastic show lined up for you today. In just a moment, ETF.com's Drew Voris will join me to discuss the second fastest ETF to ever reach $1 billion. This ETF launched in June and it already has over $1.5 billion invested in it. It's the J.P. Morgan Beta Builders Japan ETF. The only other ETF to reach a $1 billion faster was the Spider Gold Shares, ticker GLD. I think this is an interesting story because there's so much more here than meets the eye. This isn't just investors wanting exposure to Japanese stocks. So we'll look at this from multiple angles with Drew uh, in just a moment. I'll then be joined by Toby Lofton, Managing Principal at BP Capital Fund Advisors. He's going to walk us through the NYSE Pickens Oil Response ETF. This is the ETF that billionaire T. Boone Pickens has put his name behind. And the idea is to take a much more innovative approach to investing in the energy space than what you might find with traditional energy sector ETFs. And then we'll close the show today with Matt Bieleski, CEO of Defiance ETFs. He's going to spotlight a brand new ETF that just launched last week, the Defiance Future Tech ETF, which focuses on the augmented and virtual reality space. So I, I think augmented reality probably popped on everyone's radar a couple of years ago with uh, Pokemon, right? The Nintendo game everyone was walking around with uh, on their iPhones. But this space is rapidly evolving. There are some uh, fascinating things occurring here. So we'll have Matt take us through some of those, along with a virtual reality space. Really looking forward to that conversation. As always, if you have questions or comments, you can visit etfprime.com, or you can find me on Twitter, at Nate Geraci. Let's start the show today with ETF.com's editor-in-chief, Drew Voris. Time now for our weekly chat with the experts at ETF.com, the world's leading independent authority on ETFs. People have been saying there are too many mutual funds since the 80s. For all the talk of smart data, they haven't pulled in huge assets. The active managers are showing up in the ETF space. Drew, so the J.P. Morgan Beta Builders Japan ETF, ticker symbol BBJP, this is the second fastest ETF to ever reach a billion dollars behind GLD. And as I mentioned, there is a lot more to this story than just investors wanting exposure to Japanese stocks. I know you've done a little detective work behind the scenes, and we'll get to that. But first, just tell us a little bit more about the ETF itself, maybe how it compares to the competition, and uh, perhaps walk us through the recent flows here. Yeah, sure thing, Nate. Thank you for having me. Always a pleasure to be on. Uh, what's interesting here, it's really not a Japan story. It's really, in some ways, an industry story. It's also sort of the evolution of the way um, the, the future of investing. And when you see a big investment bank like J.P. Morgan, um, jumping head first into the ETF waters now, finally. They've been around for a couple of years, kind of dabbling. Um, what we're seeing is sort of a branding going on, um, Beta Builder, um, which is, is sort of ironic for J.P. Morgan, as very well known as an active manager. But they have um, basically these really core kind of uh, vanilla funds that they're starting. And, of course, they started with Japan Fund. And for investors, Japan is usually a pocket of diversification uh, stable, safe haven kind of place. Um, and what was interesting that we saw on the flows 
One, you're right, uh, Nate, it was the second fastest to $1 billion in assets under management. Uh, and we attribute that a lot to being just J.P. Morgan clients because we saw big chunks move in. Uh, and that's a little unusual for a, 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 so, sort of a, a vanilla launch uh, like Japan. But what's interesting, it's competition, uh, which is the iShares, <clears throat> excuse me, the iShares uh, MSCI J- Japan ETF, EWJ, um, saw similar outflows as we were seeing inflows uh, of that nature uh, into BBJP. Uh, and in fact, right now, Nate, it's at $1.75 billion. We're, we're probably going to hit $2 billion, uh, in a couple weeks here. And, and, and the other competing fund, EWJ, has over uh, $17 billion in assets. Uh, but here's the difference. Uh, EWJ has an expense ratio of 49 basis points, whereas BBJP has 19 uh, basis points. So the move out of there is a pretty uh, easy steer, especially when the overlap is almost uh, very similar. The top funds in both the, uh, in both those, as you would expect, and a uh, Japan equity fund are Toyota, Mitsubishi, SoftBank, Sony, et cetera, and they almost are the same weightings. So you're really getting sort of a similar product here. Uh, and, again, if you're a client of J.P. Morgan uh, and you were an EWJ and they were offering you something 30 basis points cheaper for the exact same uh, exposure, you could see how that can work uh, into the product's favor. Drew, in a piece you wrote at ETF.com last week, you, you made the point that uh, guess who the largest shareholder of EWJ uh, is it's J.P. Morgan, and you mentioned the flows out of EWJ. Obviously, we're talking about the flows into BBJP. Is it as simple as just putting two and two together? Is is, is it just flows out of EWJ and J.P. Morgan putting those into BBJP? Well, it's not scientific. Um, of course, with a mutual fund, there's a little bit more uh, transparency of ownership because uh, you're dealing with a mutual fund company, and when you redeem, you're dealing right with that company, so they know who their clients are. Uh, being an exchange traded fund, just like, uh, you know, who do you, you really don't know who owns Apple shares. You really don't know. But I mean, it's not hard to figure out. EWJ, uh, largest shareholder is JP Morgan. And we saw some symmetrical inflows and outflows. I think at the end of July, we had 1.5 billion go into the new Japan fund as we saw 1.5 billion leave, uh, EWJ. And there's really no news narrative to, to cause that. Um, and the other thing to point out that um, when we say that J.P. Morgan owns it, they own it for their clients, uh, and they also own about uh, nearly $80 billion worth of ETFs. As a, and as an ETF issuer, they currently have about a bill, a, a $11 billion in their own products. So as they move along here, and we don't expect this to be a one-off, we already have a, another fund, a European fund, BBEU, which is the beta builder uh, European fund from J.P. Morgan, also in the last two months has seen some $400 billion in assets. Um, and we expect this to be a slow build-out. Again, Europe, Japan, those are pretty easy pockets of diversification uh, for especially big clients. You mentioned J.P.'s built-in client base and, and distribution, and I actually think this is the bigger part of the story. Bloomberg's Eric Balchunas calls this BYOA, right? Bring your own assets. Can you maybe explain what that strategy is sure. in terms of building out an ETF business and, and why J.P. Morgan is in such a good spot here? Sure. Well, um, there's 2,000 ETFs now. So the idea is you're going to build something and in, in, in come – and people or investors will come is a little bit uh, far-fetched nowadays, especially when you're talking about plain vanilla funds, right? Here's a Japan fund. It's almost exactly similar to the EWJ, the iShares fund, but it's more expensive, EWJ. So you're offering something cheaper to your clients who are probably in this. Uh, Again, I want to make sure to be clear, uh, this is conjecture, but I think it's pretty logical uh, what we're seeing going on. Um, and, and so the idea is that you, you, you bring a product to your clients before you actually put it on the market. Um, and that helps in a lot of ways. One, tradability spreads. Uh, a $2 million fund is going to trade a lot differently than a $2 billion fund, as you know, Nate. Um, and, and so that immediately brings some liquidity there. And we've seen a lot of these one-offs where, in fact, Goldman Sachs launched an uh, environmental, social, and government fund, ESG, uh, ticker there, just G 
J-U-S-T, came out with $250 million right off the bat, but never gained anything more uh, since then this year. But what we're seeing, which is a little different with DBJP, I think the headlines also start to beget assets that people are starting to see, well, this is a fastest-growing fund, and they start reading it, seeing it's cheap. What a, so, so I think you know there is a herd mentality that is always a behavioral finance issue, but at the same token, I think we're seeing a, a little bit of a snowball. Just on the other flip side of the coin, uh, Nate, there is another beta builder that uh, J.P. Morgan released at the same time. It's a REIT. It's the J.P. Morgan Beta Builders MSCI U.S. REIT ETF. Uh, it has $50 million in assets. Uh, and for a fund that's two months old, a lot of issuers would be really happy with that. And granted, it's not the big headline uh, assets that we're seeing with BBJP. But still, again, if you combine these three new beta builder products, you're talking over $2 billion in assets uh, in the last two months, which represents something more than 20 percent almost of J.P. Morgan's uh, ETF assets under management. Pretty good, pretty good summer. How do you think someone like iShares is feeling about this? You mentioned earlier that J.P. has, uh, what, $80 billion invested in ETFs overall, not just their ETFs, everyone's ETFs. So I, I think your point being that there's a big chunk of change that could come out of competing ETFs and into J.P. Morgan products. Do you think that's on iShares' radar? Uh, sure, but uh, I think a lot of us would agree that we've been waiting for this. I mean, J.P. Morgan is is no small player. Um, and as I said in my blog, they get up very early in the morning to figure out how to get a piece of this $3.6 trillion pie. Um, and now with, you know, over the last couple of years, we saw with the fiduciary rule and clients' best interest, the clients are really clamoring for cheap products that give them basic vanilla coverage. Um, tactical, active management will always be there, but I think just the overall sense uh, of investors now is, you know, um, uh, Jack Bogle calls it, you know, you, you can control the cost. So people want cheap cost, uh, and if you're a J.P. Morton client and they're offering you a similar product, um, there might be some capital gains reasons not to, but on, this, on the same token, um, I think this is just the beginning uh, of what we're going to see. The new issuers are not coming in hoping and throwing spaghetti on the wall that people will will, will invest. Uh, they're basically moving clients into these funds. Uh, and if the rest of the public wants to jump on board, um, why not? Well, on that note, what does JP's ETF lineup look like uh, overall right now? And is there anything noteworthy in the hopper? I, I've actually said I think they said uh, they should launch a full suite of low-cost ETFs, core ETFs, because of their distribution, obviously they can play that low cost game. You mentioned the the European ETF, the Reed ETF, but what what does their overall lineup look like? Well, that's that, that's a that's a good point. However, uh, on, on the contrary, uh, we have a, a a story up on ETF dot com this morning on J P Morgan filing for an active core bond ETF. So now we're taking the other side of the coin. Where um, again, there's a brand here. They call it the J P Morgan Core Plus Bond ETF and it's going to invest in a range of corporate, government, and mortgage asset-backed debt. But it's going to be active. So they really have the palette of investment choices. You can get your plain vanilla beta builder. Um, I expect them to probably have some kind of S&P, um, you know, plain domestic uh, offering. But we're also seeing they're, they're not going to be shying away from active either. So I think we're going to see a broad range. And, again, um, the evolution of ETFs, seems for some people that have been in the industry a while, like it's rolling, but for others, I, I think we're just seeing the beginning of some, some different, uh, at least industry-wise, uh, and everything's good for the investors. These things are just getting cheaper and cheaper. Well, and on that note, you, you know, we've, we've sort of uh, gotten into the weeds a little bit today, just looking at the back end of this, but what do you think the key takeaways are for investors in all of this? Well, again, uh, probably not for the retail investor, does it matter? Um, are you in Japan? A lot of people really don't focus on an individual single country, even though there's a lot of money in that. A lot of that is institutional. A lot of that is diversification. Um, so it's not a play per se. Um, but on the other on the other hand, I think this is all good for investors. Um, like I said, the, the expense ratios continue to go down. And, and here we have two products. One has 30 basis points difference per year. Doesn't seem like a lot, but over the years. Uh, hey, man, you know, every percent counts. 
We have about two minutes left, and uh, I guess unrelated, but on this topic of expense ratios, before we let you go, I did want to ask you about the big news from Fidelity last week, right? They launched two self-index mutual funds that are free. They have a zero expense ratio. Any initial thoughts on that move? Yeah, well, one, just to be clear, um, two things kind of, they don't bother me, but one, just keep in mind, um, you know, this is not, you just don't get on the phone and, and get these. You have to be a client uh, of um, Fidelity, and these are mutual funds, so they're not traded on an exchange. If they were traded on an exchange for free, I think that'd be a little different, because that means it's free to anybody. It doesn't matter uh, where you're buying it at. So this is also sort of a proprietary product. Two, the other thing too, all you know, the headlines are oh, a, a zero fee index fund. Well, what's the whole point of the story that is being buried is what is the index fund? What are we talking about here? Are we talking about equities? Are we talking about S&P 500? So I get a little concerned people get caught up on the freeness, uh, and they don't understand what – I mean, okay, yeah, it's free, but you, know, you can go buy a Charles Schwab equity fund for three basis points. That's basically free. You know what you're getting. You're getting the S&P 500. I still am not quite clear. I wish the headlines had a little bit more clarity – actually what those funds are as opposed to just being free well drew as always appreciate your time uh look forward to chatting again soon thank you thank you nate always a pleasure that was drew voris editor-in-chief of etf.com and i do want to mention that next month we'll actually be joined by jp morgan's josh rogers we're going to talk much more about jp's approach to etfs and their overall strategy so be sure to catch that that'll be on september 18th Let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll be joined by Toby Lofton, Managing Principal at BP Capital Fund Advisors. We'll look at the NYSE Pickens Oil Response ETF. You're listening to ETF Prime. Welcome back to ETF Prime. We are now going to spotlight two very innovative and unique ETFs. The first one is the NYSE Pickens Oil Response ETF, ticker symbol Boon, B-O-O-N. And as you can gather by the name and in the ticker symbol, this is an ETF that billionaire T. Boone Pickens has lended his name to. This ETF just launched back in February, and I'm now very pleased to welcome to the program Toby Lofton, Managing Principal at BP Capital Fund Advisors and founder of Triline Index Solutions, which manages the index behind this ETF. Toby is joining us via phone from Dallas. Toby, a pleasure to have you on the program today. Hey, good morning, Nate. Glad to be here. Thank you. Toby, first, how is T. Boone Pickens involved with this ETF? Well, Nate, if you remember back in July of 2008, Boone launched the the Pickens plan, and it was meant to address the shortcomings of past administrations who had promised energy independence uh, by policy. And so um, what what we've done is we've taken the the principles of the Pickens plan and used them as the foundation for the design of the index. And so Boone is uh, supportive, to, to say the least, but he is uh, he loves that, that we've taken his thought leadership and crafted it into something that is actually practical and uh, relevant and timely. All right, so let's talk more about the ETF. Again, the NYSE Pickens Oil Response ETF. Walk us through the methodology here. Yeah, so I guess to, to, to start with, you know, we, we asked ourselves, look, there's a lot going on uh, in the U.S. in terms of energy production and supply and how that's affecting the rest of the world. That's been going on really since 05. But there was no real way to invest in it in, in a way that was balanced. So we said to ourselves, well, let's, let's look at the whole equity market through the lens of energy. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, here in the U.S., if you have cheap natural gas, for example, there are a host of industries that are going to benefit from that uh, decreased fuel expense or feedstock costs relative to other uh, com- competitors around the globe. So we said, all right, let's 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 look at the whole market and decide how energy-intensive is each company. And what we mean by that is 
what are the how much energy do they burn and then translating that into dollars so the number of BTUs they burn and translate that into dollars and then compare that to their their revenue and while that's a, a helpful start the the alternative way of looking at it is from a top down perspective and instead of saying hey this is an energy company because it has assets that are part of the the supply chain let's look at it through the lens of how the equity price is related to oil prices. We chose Brent crude oil because we believe that it is the global benchmark for the price of a British thermal unit because it's seaborne and it, it just it serves as a, a better tool, whereas West Texas Intermediate, for example, is, is landlocked here in the U.S. So once once we established that, we said, all right, let's, let's start with the NYSE 1000 and let's run a correlation analysis to all stocks in, in that group and we'll take as a first step, the top uh, 40th percentile. By the way, the correlation was not done just on the first month of, of Brent. Instead, we did it over multiple periods. So three month, six month, 12 month, three year, and five year. That was meant to rid any type of noise in the front end and also to uh, avoid any type of you know, spurious relationships. Um, and so then once we take the top 40th percentile, we apply a qualitative screen. And that qualitative screen is meant to uh, knock out certain industries that don't really have a true fundamental relationship with oil prices. For example, banks. Banks don't really burn hydrocarbons. There are some banks that lend to energy companies, but that's not what we're trying to capture here. So at the end of the day, what you arrive at is a, a group of companies that – reflect not only a relationship to oil prices, but the information that's contained in oil prices that's related to economic activity globally. And so these are uh, U.S.-based companies, a uh, minimum market cap of $2 billion, and a minimum average daily trading value of $10 million. The index was actually designed to be able to underpin a fixed index annuity product and could be as, as large as $5 billion dollars. But um, we started with the the ETF B O O N. And how many uh, holdings total? Yeah, we currently have eighty one for this year, but the the index is reconstituted annually. And so, if you look at the twenty year back test, what you'll find is a range of roughly seventy five to one hundred and twenty five companies uh, comprising the index annually. I want to go back to something you mentioned earlier. You mentioned that to determine individual companies, you look for what's called uh, energy intensity. Can you perhaps give us some more detail on exactly how you measure that? Yeah, so the, the, the initial way we look at it is we say, what is the economic value added by the company? And we, we measure that by saying, all right, here's the energy consumed, and that's the numerator. So we, we figure out how many British thermal units did a company actually burn, gas, oil, NGLs. And then we divide that by the total revenue or economic value added over a period. So we get some relationship between how much energy did they burn and then compare that to their total sales. But then we go a step further, and we, we have four categories of uh, what we call end users of energy. And there's – cost takers, there's cost pushers, there are those who have a relative cost advantage, and then there's finally revenue uh, or, or margin enhancers. And so within those four categories, there are there are different companies uh, that, that rest uh, within each. Well, I was going to ask you, how, how might you exclude somebody like airlines, where theoretically their demand is going to pick up as the economy is doing well, maybe have oil prices uh, increasing, but at the same time, that's a very costly input for airlines. H how is something like that screened out? Yeah, so uh, airlines are, are typically, they fall into the, the, bu the bucket of the cost taker, and we, we don't necessarily uh, like that particular category because they don't have as much control over the, the cost inputs and what ultimately happens to their bottom line. And, and traditionally, airlines have had a, a less stable business model, um, and, and we, don't, we, want, we don't want folks to view the end-user bucket as a hedge, where when oil prices go up, the traditional energy does well and the other side does poorly. That's not how this is built. This is really what you need to think of is 
as the traditional energy group, meaning the ENP, exploration and production, and oil field services, usually does well in a rising price environment. Well, so do industrials and materials, for example, as economic activity begins to ramp. And usually when oil prices are going up, that's an indication that demand is strong. And so uh, economic activity is, is uh, ramping up along with it. So th- that's really the, the design or the spirit behind it. Our guest is Toby Lofton, Managing Principal at BP Capital Fund Advisors. We're spotlighting the NYSE Pickens Oil Response ETF. Uh, Toby, can you maybe do a little compare and contrast between, uh, between Boone and some of the other prominent energy sector ETFs? Obviously, this is a, a popular space for investors. Uh, give us a few of the, the, the main points of differentiation here. Sure. Well, you know, if you look at the XLE, for example, it's the, one of the largest uh, ETFs in the energy space, and it's based on the, the global industry classification system uh, by, by the MSCI. And you look at the top three constituents, and it's ExxonMobil, Chevron, and Schlumberger. Well, that's 45% of, of, of that XLE, whereas in Boone, we've got equal weight across the 81 constituents, for example. But more importantly, if you look at the, the components, we are balanced across the energy value chain, meaning we have upstream, downstream, and end users, whereas when you look at the XLE or XOP or the OIH, they are they're specifically uh, honing in on one part of the value chain as opposed to having a more balanced uh, set of exposure. And, and what our, our intent is to maintain the upside but reduce the the downside and over a you know, 20 year back test when you look at the the sharp ratio the pickens oil response index has a superior um, number associated with it now we realize that's a back test but that's the the spirit of the design by uh, by which boone is is built so if I were to maybe restate that, uh, some of the other energy sector ETFs you're saying are more uh, upstream companies where you have oil and gas producers, uh, oil field service companies, and so uh, perhaps they're, they're a lot more sensitive to commodity prices, which can obviously be uh, boom or bust. Is that sort of a fair way to state that? That's exactly right. And look, if, if Boone were on the show with us, he would say, fellas, it's, it's really tough to pick the tops and the bottoms. So what we're trying to do is make energy investable, and that's why we're redefining it. We think that the old Gix way of looking at things, that, that lens is it's not a bad lens. It's just not necessarily the one that you should view today's market in. I mean, I'll cite as an example, you know, the, the Gix changed the, the telecommunications sector recently, and we viewed that as a rear-view mirror type maneuver, whereas what we're trying to do is look at the market in relative terms as opposed to absolute terms because we think that's that's a, a more um, contemporary method of, of going about it. Toby, we have a few minutes left. Let's talk more about the overall investment case for energy. Why own something like Boone in a portfolio? Well, look, when you zoom out and you say, okay, what's what's happened here in the U.S.? from an energy perspective. Let's turn to the supply side for a minute. So back in 2005, you had the Barnett Shale here in Dallas-Fort Worth kickoff as really the first shale play to be developed in earnest. That was primarily natural gas, but we turned our attention to oil and liquids back in 2009, and the inflection from, say, two, or excuse me, 5 million barrels per day of oil production to today were north of 10 million barrels per day of production here in the U.S. That's led to the U.S. becoming a global exporter of, of crude oil. I mean, last month we had 3 million barrels per day of crude oil exit the U.S. As late as two, December of 2015, we were exporting zero because there was a, an export ban. So there are huge uh, movements that are, that are unfolding on the supply side that's affecting the global energy markets. Now, I say all that, and and then it naturally begs the question: Well, who's which companies benefit? Well, there's companies in the Permian, for example, in West Texas, who represent the, the total recoverable oil, and the production is larger than the the country of Iran. And so, most people don't realize that that the Permian is becoming 
almost its own uh, state of, of oil production that affects the, the rest of the world. Tons of, of uh, work that we do fundamentally to identify the, the companies that are benefiting there, but that, the U.S. is going to continue to play an increasing role in oil supply. Toby, you mentioned a movement. What, what about the movement towards clean energy, right? Solar, wind, water. There's obviously a lot of focus around climate change and the environment. Is that a potential longer-term risk at all in, in this particular sector? Yeah, it's, it certainly is. But, you know, I, I would take you to the fact that one of the constituents in the oil index, oil response index, is first solar. And the reason it's in there is that when you think about solar projects, it's connected to oil prices because all energy is connected to some extent. And we, we view first solar almost like a series of call options on oil prices. And so um, we're cognizant of, of what's going on with respect to renewable energy. In fact, that was part of the Pickens plan. It was about anything American, whether it was wind, solar, nat gas, you name it. We wanted to be energy independent. So over time, I think the Pickens Oil Response Index will adapt according to the rules and the methodology that, that we've built, and uh, it'll address the, the question that you're, you're asking. Well, Toby, great spotlight today. Really interesting approach to the energy space. Certainly wish you uh, all the success. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Nate. I appreciate it. That was Toby Lofton, Managing Principal at BP Capital Fund Advisors and founder of Triline Index Solutions. Again, the ETF is the NYSE Pickens Oil Response ETF. And you can learn more about this ETF by visiting tboonetf.com. That's tboonetf.com. Let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll spotlight another very innovative ETF, the Defiance Future Tech ETF, This focuses on augmented and virtual reality. We'll be joined by the CEO of Defiance ETFs, Matt Bieleski. This is ETF Prime. Welcome back to ETF Prime. The next ETF we're going to spotlight today is one that just launched last week. It's called the Defiance Future Tech ETF, ticker symbol AUGR. This focuses on investment opportunities surrounding augmented and virtual reality technology. And joining us via phone from New York to discuss this ETF is Matt Bieleski, CEO of Defiance ETFs. Uh, Matt, great to have you on the program today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Hey, Matt, before we get to the ETF, I thought it might be helpful to first have you provide some background on augmented and virtual reality for people who may be unfamiliar with this space. And I know there's a lot of cutting-edge technology here, but just high level, what is this? Yeah, sure. You know, So, so virtual reality is really meant to put um, the user in a, a simulated environment by really a computer-generated type of type of experience. You're kind of entering the simulated world where augmented reality really enhances um, your actual your actual world um, with a digital interactive experience uh, in real time. So virtual reality, you're entering a simulated environment um, where augmented reality is you're really enhancing your current real environment in, in live time, in real time. In terms of augmented reality, I feel like this really went mainstream with uh, Pokemon, right? Do you think that's when augmented reality sort of flashed on everyone's radar? Uh, I mean, actually, if you go back to the 90s, I don't know if you watch watch NFL or Monday Night Football, but you know, back in, I think it was 1998, is when the NFL first um, implemented that first down yellow line. And that's really a, uh, an example of augmented reality in sports for the first time. And since then, it's really, you know, evolved and proliferated from from sports to gaming into into real, you know, live type of um, you know sectors like medicine and healthcare. Well, it's interesting you, you mentioned sports. Just last week, I read an article in the Kansas City Star here in town where they talked about how the Sprint Center, which is the arena here, they're actually going to test augmented reality for some college basketball games where fans can hold up their phones, face them to the court, 
and get immediate stats on players. They can track their movements. It, it really is amazing. It does seem like we're just scratching the surface with this technology. H- how has it evolved, I guess, in the sports arena uh, from back in the 90s? Yeah, I mean, if you, I mean, you look from you look at just like I mean, if you watch uh, the NBA, NBA Finals, you store you know augmented reality, you know, live in real time with you know the announcers going onto the court and, and literally standing next to Steph Curry as he's you know shooting a half court shot. So you you really experience for the first time um, a really tangible in the NBA Finals most recently. But I think more important than sports is really seeing how it evolves um, into the, the healthcare field. And I, you know, at Defiance, that's where we really believe it's going to. Um, you know, cause real disruption. Um, and if you look at augmented reality and why it will cause disruption is like imagine, you know, a, a surgeon doing a surgery and before augmented reality, the surgeon actually had to cut open the individual to perform the, the surgery. With augmented reality, let's say you're doing a surgery on a, on a tumor um, in your brain. Now you can use augmented reality to see the actual tumor live in 360 degrees um, before going into the surgery, and that's why we think you know augmented reality from both real life surgeries and, and training is really going to kind of change um, you know the healthcare type of sectors. All right, so let's talk about the ETF, the Defiance Future Tech ETF. Again, ticker symbol AUGR. Explain for us what this ETF holds, how many holdings, how holdings are selected, anything else uh, noteworthy. Yeah, sure. So this ETF really covers three. Uh, main sectors within augmented and virtual reality. Um, the first is interfaces and displays. That, that's about 36%. Uh, the second is gaming, which is around 20%. And the third sector is AI and machine learning software, which is about uh, 15, uh, 15%. So what, what, what we do is we benchmark to the Blue Star Augmented and Virtual Reality Index, which provides um, stocks to around 60, 60 companies globally across all market caps. So you're going to get um, exposure to stocks in the U.S., France, Japan, uh, and Korea. And what's really important to note is that the index methodology um, is equally weighted. So you'll get exposure to companies like, you know, Facebook and Apple, but you also get companies to less-known companies like Dassault um, Systems, uh, Faro Technologies, et cetera. So it's a great way to kind of get, you know, precise exposure to companies developing and implementing the technology behind augmented and, and, and virtual reality. You know, in perusing the holdings of the CTF, you mentioned Facebook. Uh, they stuck out to me, Walt Disney. I, I know Facebook has some sort of a, a VR headset. Can you maybe tell us more about what both of those companies are doing around AR, VR? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, Facebook, um, I, and I think it was in 2014, they purchased Oculus VR for, for about $2.3 billion in cash and stock. And, you know, they've been really pushing out that VR set. I actually, my wife bought me one. It's, it's actually really, really cool. So they're, they're definitely in the forefront of the actual um, VR headsets. And, and Disney is doing something really cool. Where they're, they're, you know, launching a virtual reality vest. So imagine entering the simulated world, right? So visually you experience all these things, right? And then you have a vest where you can physically uh, experience. So that's almost like mixed reality. Um, an example would be putting on a virtual reality headset and a vest and playing a, vi- a boxing video game. So imagine boxing and actually feeling the punches um, on, your, on your body. So think about how that would really ch- you know, shape training for, for sports, for example. Yeah. And that's, that's led by Walt Disney, the actual the vest. Matt, we've touched on uh, sports. You mentioned a really interesting example with healthcare, obviously Facebook and what they're doing, Disney. I, I'm curious, are there some technologies that maybe the average investor uh, wouldn't be aware of or, or hasn't heard about in, in this space, maybe something off the beaten path? In regards to the actual exposure? Yeah, just in terms of the, the underlying technology itself and, and what's occurring around AR, VR. Yeah, I think another example, so I'm, you know, I served in the, in the military, and I think, you know, w- one thing we used was virtual reality headsets to actually experience, you know, what it would be like to enter, um, you know, a, a military, you know, conflict zone. So you think about from a military standpoint, right, you know, you look at the, the Marines or the Navy SEALs doing a mission, you know, abroad. So think about actually they can experience what it's like um, to go into a, a, an unknown place um, to perform a mission. So we think from a military application um, as well, it's going to disrupt and really, you know, help protect our troops abroad. Our guest is Matt Bieleski, CEO of Defiance ETFs. We're spotlighting the Defiance Future Tech ETF, ticker symbol AUGR. 
Matt, where did the uh, idea for the CTF come from? Well, actually, my the, the funny part is my wife actually bought me uh, one of those Oculus uh, virtual reality headsets for, for Hanukkah, and then I uh, and then I launched my ETF company. And she was like, "You should launch an ETF for that." So then I, I kind of took took a deeper dive and I looked in. I looked if there was actually a virtual and augmented reality ETF and in the ETF space, and at that point, there really there really wasn't. And I looked at what's kind of you know taking over the investment world and its disruptive technology. So we we really saw a fit for this in in an asset allocation portfolio, you know, as a complement to broad-based, you know, kind of cheap technology beta like QQQ. Um, So really for a missing missing piece in a a disruptive technology asset allocation model. Well, on that note, any thoughts on thematic ETFs as a whole? You know, I feel like sometimes they seem to take a lot of heat. People will say they're too niche, they're too gimmicky, too risky. You really hear it all. And maybe some of that is warranted in certain cases, but in your opinion, what makes for a good thematic ETF? Yeah, I think I think really maintaining the integrity of the underlying theme you're trying to benchmark. I don't even like using the word thematic because I really think it perverts what we're trying to accomplish. So we're trying to give you, you know, disruptive beta exposure and by by equally weighting an index, right? That's that's the first step in really constructing a good product because, you know, fangs and, you know, everyone's portfolios by having equal weight exposure, you know, the smaller growth companies, um, you know, in that index have the same exposure to a company like Facebook and Apple. But more importantly, you have to ask yourself this, where does it fit in a portfolio? So if you have a thematic ETF that's kind of, whether it's political driven or just trying to capture, you know, the theme of the week, you know, there really isn't room for that. For, for ETFs like augmented reality and ones that focus on specific technology themes like quantum computing, there is a place for that in the portfolio, and that's in the technology sleeve as an alpha generation. Matt, overall, we, we've touched on uh, a number of the different technologies uh, in this space, but can you maybe just state the, the overall investment thesis here, the investment case? Uh, why might investors want to look at this longer term? Yeah, I mean... Technology of, of our parents is not technology of, of today. You know, if you look at what is real technology, it's, it's the disruptive sectors, not only augmented and virtual reality. You know, it's cybersecurity, it's robotics, it's AI, it's machine learning, it's quantum computing. And, you know, we, know, we think that these sectors, that these, these companies and these subsectors are going to really change, um, you know, all sectors across the board, and it's going to become more important to have exposure to these type of of companies in a, in, a, in a portfolio. Matt, I'm just curious, what's your background? How did you end up uh, uh, starting a new ETF company? You mentioned the, the background on the ETF. Uh, what's your background? Yeah, a great question. My background, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm an ETF guy. I've only worked in you know, ETF throughout my career. I worked at you know, ProShares and on the portfolio and, and trading side and helped structure some of the leverage products there. Uh, got great experience in being on the you know, BlackRock iShares team and really you know, covering kind of top clients and understanding kind of the core of where ETFs, ETFs in the portfolio. And then most recently, I was at Direction, a premier leverage and inverse ETF provider where I covered really, you know, large institutional um, type of clients, which got me really, you know, good experience. So I've been always in ETFs, but I've also personally invested in a lot of um, uh, Israeli tech startup companies, which really kind of, you know, um, sparked my interest in, in technology. And I looked at the competitive landscape, and I realized there was really – uh, a missing piece of uh, a company that really focused purely on passive, disruptive technology exposure. And that's what we're going to focus you at here at uh, Defiance. Where did the name of the company come from? Uh, that's an even better question. So the <laughs> name, um, Defiance, uh, it's actually a movie um, about my grandfather, um, Zeus Belsky. He staged the largest armed rescue of Jews by Jews uh, in the Holocaust. So back in, uh, I think it was 08, the film uh, came out, and uh, actually Lev Schreiber uh, played my grandfather in the film, and, and Daniel Craig played uh, his brother. So we named the, the, the company after that story, but more importantly, I think the name Defiance also fits into kind of the, you know, the disruptive technology themes we're trying to really benchmark to as well. All right, we have uh, just a few minutes left here. I know you probably can't speak to specific details, but... Can you perhaps give us any sense as to what might be in store for Defiance ETFs uh, moving forward? Yeah, I can. I can talk very, very broadly. You know, 
we want to we want to provide passive exposure for um, disruptive tech. So we're gonna we're gonna you know really focus on the themes that are kind of missing in clients' portfolios. So you know we can't talk about products that aren't filed for, but you know we just filed for a quantum computing ETF um, that tickers QTUM. And, you know, we're going to be launching a bunch of other, you know, products that are kind of in that space. We want to offer basically really a full model portfolio of carving all disruptive tech in a, in a utopian uh, world of portfolio. And I have to ask you, you mentioned your background. You've been at ProShares, iShares, Direction. Uh, as you look forward just at the ETF industry as a whole, uh, what, what do you think the future looks like? You know, there's, a, there's certainly a, a laser-like focus on fees. Uh, we've seen the growth in areas like smart beta. There's a lot of buzz around ESG, but you know the assets haven't necessarily been there. W- what's your overall outlook on the ETF space? Yeah, so at Defiance, we just we don't believe in smart beta. Uh, we think there's going to be continued fee compression by the big players, you know, iShares and Vanguard, and you know they're going to go after the fixed income space where we think there's a huge opportunity. You know, we think you know potentially one to two trillion dollars, but that's not really the space that that we're uh, work we're competing in, we think that there's going to be a, a, lot, a lot of fee compression and a lot more competition coming into the into the market. So what do you think just about the, the overall growth of the industry moving forward? Uh, I mean, if you look at the numbers, I think it was BlackRock or Schwab who put a report that's around, you know, five, you know, five trillion dollars in ETFs. And over the next five years can go anywhere from, you know, 10 to, to 20 trillion dollars. So we think with the proliferation of, of fee based business, advisor fee compression, um, natural adoption of ETFs from overly priced, you know, benchmark hugging um, mutual funds, and we think that you know there's only going to be continued growth. And we think this is really, and I've been ETF since 2008, um, and to see how they've grown and become so popular, you know, I, I still think we're at the uh, beginning phases of um, you know ETFs. Well, Matt, with that, we'll have to leave it there. Really appreciate you joining us on the uh, program today. Congratulations on the launch, and uh, best of luck to you. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. That was Matt Bieleski, CEO of Defiance ETFs. Again, the ETF is the Defiance Future Tech ETF, and you can learn more about that ETF by visiting defianceetfs.com. That's defianceetfs.com. Podcasts of ETF Prime are available at etfprime.com, etf.com, and also on iTunes. You can follow me on Twitter, at Nate Geraci. We have a fantastic show for you next week. We'll first be joined by Jerry O'Reilly, Principal and Portfolio Manager at Vanguard. He's going to give us an inside look at managing index funds. So you think of index funds as just being on autopilot and there's really nothing to do. Couldn't be further from the case. Uh, So Jerry will take us behind the scenes. And then Todd Rosenbluth, Director of ETF and Mutual Fund Research at CFRA, will talk about Fidelity's recent announcement to offer free index funds. Should be a great show. Until then, have a great week, everyone.